Hello everyone, my name is Rosin, and welcome back to Let's Play Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 2. Last time, we made our way through the final major area of the demon world, the Mountain of Horror, and uh, yeah, we had a good time going through the caverns, talking to some fly people that we met along the way. Uh, stumbled around in some darkness for a little bit, that wasn't too fun. Uh, went through even more dungeon, and then finally at the end, we had a little bit of a change of pace from the uh, normal format of this game. We got to the boss, Beelzebub, who... Uh, Actually, didn't want to fight, just wanted to talk. Turns out Beelzebub is one of two uh, halves of a greater demon known as Baal, uh, and the other half was none other than Bale, who was still uh, a frog, uh, who was hanging out in our inventory um, after we had defeated him so long ago. So Beelzebub kindly asked, hey, uh, would you allow me to return to my previous state because at some point in history uh, we were sundered in two by the one true god and I'd really appreciate it if we could become Baal again and uh, if you say yes that happens and Baal says hey thanks a lot I'm gonna join your party uh, I'm gonna turn this uh, key item you recently got called the palace stone to the palace ring and uh, let's go to Lucifer's temple and just uh, see what the deal is and talk with him a bit so very uh, very interesting development um, and yeah we are about to approach the second to last dungeon in this game, which is pretty exciting stuff. I know I probably didn't sound too hot on the dungeon we went through basically all of last episode. Uh, not my favorite dungeon in the world. I think it just uh, isn't super interesting in terms of its design, and it's just kind of a slog. Um, and that's not to say that these uh, these uh, next two dungeons that we're about to go through aren't necessarily long uh, in their own way either, but I just think that they're a little more interesting to run through, and I, I just have more fun with them than the uh, Mountain of Horror, which I think just uh, is a little uh, a little long in the tooth, let's just say. I went back to Masakados here because I thought that... Uh, or Masakado, I forget, singular. Um, I went back to Masakado here because I thought that... Uh, you could get something from him, but I think I actually needed to wait a little bit longer. So, whoops, that was my mistake, but, you know, always always a good idea to check. So, the last area on this list of fast travel shrine locations we can go to is the Remote Island, which I believe we've actually been able to uh, go to ever since that Echidna dropped the Dull Orb for us, I want to say. So, this may look familiar to those of you who uh, have been watching this playthrough and really, for some reason, have memorized the layout of the Demon World. This is actually the little spot above the crazy village in the uh, Fields of Lunacy. I believe that's what it's called. I can't... I sometimes I forget which area is which, but I'm pretty sure the Fields of Lunacy is the fire area. Um, but yeah, you may remember this tower that we're going into as the spot that Lord Asmodai teleported us to early on in the game as part of his dastardly trap. And uh, I believe it was either Izanami or Izanagi uh, realized that we were stuck there and kindly warped us back to the human world. So it's kind of good to be able to wrap back around to this place, and it's uh, a little more significant than just a little side area you can go to if you accidentally stumble onto Esmodai's trap. Uh, you know, it's kind of a cool little example of foreshadowing, I suppose, where um, this place becomes real significant right here at the end of the game. Um, but you really otherwise don't know too much about its existence, uh, other than if you stumbled onto it through that little piece of optional content, which is pretty neat. And I'm sure, too, after getting the Echidna Orb, a lot of players who even didn't go through Esmodai's, uh, trap, uh, just noticed, like, oh, hey, the, I got a new orb, I wonder if I can go anywhere with this, and probably went over here, um, just to check it out and explore a little bit. Though there's not really all that much you can do here, frankly, until, uh, we reach this point in the game, so... You can see, since we've already been through here, map's already filled out. But what more can you ask for? It's very nice, very nice indeed. Music is still a banger. Good track, just a good track overall. Gotta circumnavigate this and get more into the central area here so that we can go up these stairs. I believe the third floor is actually pretty simple, too, in terms of layout. Yeah, look at that. We're right at the end here. Just gotta make it through a few encounters that we can just completely steamroll by this point in the game. And hey, dropped a serpent plate. That's pretty cool. Not as useful anymore at this point in the game, obviously. But, uh, you know, if you don't pull the one from the stone, you can uh, get that one from a lich here, so... Probably a very rare chance, I'd have to imagine. I 
I always love it when we turn into a ball of light and just kind of fly northward. And there we are. You can see, uh, I believe even you could see that beyond the uh, Mountain of Horror uh, actual dungeon, you know, over in the uh, over in the distance you can see, oh, there's a weird structure to the north that I can't access. It's none other than Lucifer's Temple. There we go. We got it. The Orb of Hope. Now that's a that's a mystical uh, artifact name if I've ever heard one. The Orb of Hope. Alrighty, Izanami, we really gotta stop saying hope here. We are getting way too close to Danganronpa territory for my own comfort, and that's just a just a dangerous path. I don't I don't want to go down. We are once again traveling by a magical ball of light. Over the weird source of water that seems to flow across all of the demon world. That's that's just something visually I really like about the demon world's design is the fact that at that center there there appears to be this weird sprout or font of water uh, that flows outward throughout the entire demon world in, in all directions, which uh, makes me wonder about the geography of this place and what it's trying to communicate about uh, the the uh, uh, landscape here. That's the word I'm looking for. The terrain and elevation and whatnot. Like, is this supposed to be, like, a giant mountain of a world and that water flows from the from the top there and then, you know, or sprouts from the top there and then flows downward? Or how does that work? But whatever the case is, I'm happy that they just, uh, they didn't do, like, a recolor of the ocean tiles on the uh, Tokyo World map and just made it red to look like blood or whatever. Like, it actually uh, is its own unique thing with a unique animation for the demon world. A uh, very cool visual touch that I appreciate a lot. And what better to, uh, or what better enemy to fight first going through Lucifer's castle than a couple of leviathans? Unfortunately, I do not believe that it's parallel the, um, behemoth makes an appearance in this castle, or even Megami Tensei 2 in general. Maybe you confuse it, but I'm not entirely... I don't think it made the cut for the second game. It's interesting, you know, there's a, there's a lot more demons in Megami Tensei 2 than Megami Tensei 1, but that being said, there are still a handful of demons from the first game that didn't make the cut for the second one, uh, for whatever reason. I've always kind of wondered that, too. Just, just been really curious to uh, get a sense for... Um, you know, Atlas has this huge lineup and, and list of demons or, or, you know, unique takes on demons that they've created for these games over the many, many years that they've been made. And I really wonder what uh, what decision-making process they go through for what makes the cut and what doesn't. Um, that just really interests me. I wonder, I almost wonder if they kind of design the game first and kind of the flow of the areas and what they want out of each area and then build up the enemies around that. Uh, because I'm sure that they have to go through each of these and be like, okay, we need a demon in this area that's really good at healing, or we want something that uh, is kind of more of like an electricity elemental thing, or, you know, one that can block f physical attacks, and then they kind of take that list of needs and maybe try to um, put in enemies around that, but uh, I'm, just, I'm just really curious what that uh, whole part of the creation process for these games look like. Like, do they have a target number that they want to hit, or do they kind of reach that number naturally anyways? Um, I know one of the big things before Shin Megami Tensei 4 came out, actually, was, uh, this is the most demons, I think, that that have ever been in the series, I think. Um, was kind of a point that they wanted to hammer home there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I wonder what those types of conversations look like when they have them. Always fun teleporting around. Yeah, this last area is a uh, again another fairly complex um, dungeon with a lot of uh, warping and different possible routes to go down. Some of them being dead ends and yeah, um, I I think this is just a more interesting dungeon to go through than the uh, very elongated cavern system that was the Mountain of Horror. They even sprinkle in a few dark areas here, too, and I actually think they're handled uh, a little better here than they were in the Mound of Horror, from uh, what I can remember. And also, too, I just think the enemies here are a, a little more, um, well, maybe not less annoying, but um, I think they are uh, interesting in their own way. You keep running into this spe specific enemy encounter, though, which is a little weird. 
sometimes RNG just be like that, I guess. Going through the series of rooms. There's one specific enemy I want to talk about whenever we get to it, but I don't know when that's going to be. I know it happens at some point in this video. Because it's one you're going to want to watch out for. Like the Mountain of Horror, there is a, another enemy with a nasty trick up its sleeve that you're going to want to watch out for when you run into it here. And there she is. So, Volva is yet another demon who is going to be able to reflect physical attacks. So... Don't be like me. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, Volva is actually a worse enemy to fight than Grimma Hikala because it actually also has a nasty set of spells, including, I believe, a... a I think it has Mazio... Uh, Mazionga or something like that. Um, it, it has a group magic attack of some type that can... Uh, it doesn't do the worst damage in the world, but it, it, it can do some pretty bad damage. Uh, it also has Curse, which is an instant death spell, uh, which uh, low success rate typically, but if it hits, you know, you're going to be down to party member, which sucks. Uh, thankfully, Ball has Samurai Karm, which comes in handy for uh, being able to revive our fallen foes, or fallen allies. Um, and also uh, has a sleep spell that will uh, put the party to sleep, which, uh, you know, just bad combination of qualities overall that that demon has. So that is another uh, demon that you're going to want to be careful whenever you run into it. Getting closer to the top of the castle here. Gotta make it through this ominous red fog first, but we're making pretty good time, all things considered. Uh-oh, it's Kronos. I've seen how you devoured your children like I devour a slice of pizza, so uh, don't want to deal with that. Thankfully, he's kind of a pushover in this game. Dealt with him pretty quick. Another mythological figure here, this time from Norse mythology, Loki. Uh, not really a fan of this old classic Loki design, just looks a little whatever to me. Also, I know that was supposed to be like a war axe or something that he was carrying. I didn't really get a good look at it, but every time I see that sprite, I'm like, why is Loki holding a shovel? Like, <laughs> that's always what that registers as uh, in my brain first. Those of you who watched the Megami Tensei 1 playthrough or played through the game yourself may recognize the top of Lucifer's Castle here, and sorry for spinning around and making the screen look really weird because of how this game handles the turning uh, at that specific point in the map, but uh, yeah, this is just like the uh, top floor of uh, Lucifer's uh, Castle in the uh, first game. Though, of course, this time without the trap tiles, thankfully. <laughs> we can just walk forward. This is, all things considered, a pretty cool Lucifer site. Uh, sprite, rather. Uh, he may not take up the whole screen like he did when he was a final boss, but... Really like the uh, aura effect coming off of the uh, top there, kind of like a halo-looking thing. And I enjoy that they kind of incorporate a uh, Promethean element to Lucifer's uh, backstory here. Another type of mythological story archetype I always uh, find myself drawn to. The idea of a uh, deity or a celestial entity uh, gifting humans with something that the uh, uh, greater cosmological force disagrees with and uh, the deity is punished for it. And I like the uh, portrait that uh, we get of our new primary antagonist here, as Lucifer describes the uh, true character of the uh, god that we are allegedly the uh, messiah following the orders of throughout this game. And I do think it's interesting that the demons do seem to still be referring to the character as the messiah, as if that, uh, you know, is maybe more of a actual true prophetic thing, uh, even though pretty early on it, it seems like it's just a sham being... Uh, 
sold to us by Pazuzu, who wants us to, to do his bidding. Though it could just be a case too, maybe he was just the first person to uh, get a hold of us, and he knew that we were actually the Messiah, and wanted to twist the myth and legend to his own ends. And some of you may be confused if you're unfamiliar with Megami Tensei, like, wait a minute, we're talking to Satan right now. Well, something that is important to note is that Atlas likes to uh, differentiate Lucifer and Satan uh, in the Megami Tensei series as two separate entities, with Satan uh, tending to be based more on a uh, certain um, belief, uh, a certain uh, depiction of uh, Satan that appears in some uh, Abrahamic beliefs, where Satan is actually a servant of God, who um, I, I believe like tempts and judges um, people uh, under God's orders, um, whereas Lucifer is the uh, rebellious entity that fell from heaven after trying to wage war against uh, God himself. So uh, it kind of goes with that line of thinking here, where they are uh, two different characters, and they are often at odds in uh, these games. So... If you're a little confused by that, like, wait a minute, I, I thought we were talking to the devil right now. Well, the uh, the devil is two different, uh, two different people in these games, so. And often, almost always have really stellar designs. I, I always really love what they do with both Lucifer and Satan in all of these uh, different games. And Lucifer did give us his sword. Lucifer's sword is also going to be another piece of equipment that is going to have an intelligence... Um, modifier to it like lucifer told us oh it's cursed or whatever but really what i think that means just is that you need i believe it's at least 20 intelligence and you can't use any sort of buffs or anything like that like you can't you can't have less than 20 intelligence but use armor bonuses to get past that threshold you actually just need to have 20 intelligence uh or over 20 intelligence with uh takuma to be able to equip lucifer's sword but once you do it is able to hit between one to eight times and it has Pretty solid attack power. It's not the most powerful weapon in the game. We're actually about to... Well, okay, how should I put this? It doesn't have the highest attack value in the game, but the weapon that does can only hit one to two times, and we're actually going to go pick that up right now uh, just because I wanted to showcase how to get that uh, if you're not able to meet the requirements for using Lucifer's sword because I'm sure, like the Lucifer armor, a lot of people are going to get to this point in the game and just not have the stat build uh, to uh, accommodate for that sort of equipment, so... Yeah, it does, uh, it does a good amount of damage, uh, has one of the highest attack values in the game, not the highest, but the fact that it can hit up to eight times makes it, in practice, the most powerful weapon that you can possibly get in Megami Tensei 2. So yeah, we, we have top-of-the-line equipment here. Gonna be returning most of my party because Lucifer has joined our team now, and he is just by far the best demon you can get in the game. 950 hit points, uh, a, uh, not, not the most incredible list of spells in the game, but uh, hits pretty hard, all things considered, and just makes for a very good uh, third core ally to have as part of the team. And now, uh, as you can uh, probably think, um, you know, we have Takuma, Asuka, and Lucifer holding up the front row here, and then if you take into account the three demons we got from the uh, Papa Frost weird uh, little secret thing there with the um, Codebreaker nonsense that we went through. We have a full party of incredibly powerful demons at our disposal now, which is excellent stuff. What I'm doing now is I've gone back to the human world. We are done with the demon world. We never gotta go back there ever again. We are uh, right before the end of the game. We just need to go through one more final dungeon. But before we do that, I am taking a little detour back to Ueno because I wanted to actually go ahead and grab a... Um, Another secret weapon that you can get. If I recall correctly, when we went to um, that uh, part of the demon world via Ueno by walking around that statue um, the first time, I believe you got the Nile Blade from that. It might have been the Serpent Blade. It was one of those one of those two swords. Um, but yeah, if you have previously obtained the Nile Blade prior to your uh, trip to Lucifer's Temple and recruiting Lucifer, uh, you can actually go back there again with Lucifer in tow and get uh, a even more powerful blade. So that's pretty cool. And I'm uh, going to be depicting that here as we end up, or uh, close out the episode. And like I said, if you don't have the intelligence required to uh, equip Lucifer's sword, the sword that we are about to get from uh, going on this little side journey here is going to be your next best bet for uh, tackling the final dungeon. 
and I highly recommend that you uh, do get it, because uh, final boss, a lot of health. A lot of health. <laughs> so you're going to want everything you can to uh, benefit you in the final battle. Just got to keep going through all these tunnels. Slowly but surely. Going to make it to Ueno eventually. And yeah, as you can see, just e even though we just have Lucifer uh, in our party, uh, we are draining through Magnetite at a staggering rate, which is why I decided to return my other demons. Uh, having him out is a good idea if you want to just crush your opposition, walk just walking around and stuff, but it will do a number on your uh, currency, so just keep that in mind. And here we go. We're going to go back to the Demon World Island and uh, going to get a new sword. It is once again the Hinokagatsuchi, which was the best sword in the previous game. I'm happy it made a return appearance here. And of course it is the best sword in Shin Megami Tensei 1 as well. Ja, before this wraps up, I just want to say a quick correction too. I've seen some people say that when you pick up this sword from the first sword that was here in this area, you can't get rid of it, and you you need to have it in, in your inventory in order to use the Hinokagatsuchi. Uh, that's not true. Um, you just need to have picked it up once before. So, yeah, don't worry about that. As long as you've picked it up once, you can get rid of it, lose it, whatever. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and you can pick up the Hinokagatsuchi. So, yeah, I'll see you next time.